here is local costume design assistant and uh, sort of assistant shop manager. So what that means is when the a designer comes in from out of town, I am the person here who assists them in getting the show up on its feet, as well as Jen, who is our shop manager. We sort of streamline all the work and make sure everything's getting done. And I mostly do shopping. So um, when you know a designer comes in with a picture of what they want and says, oh, I need a yellow shirt for the show, I go find the yellow shirt that they need. Um, as well as with Jen and our other shop members, we do fittings, which means once the actor has the yellow shirt, we try it on them. Um, and uh, generally putting out fires like the actor has the wrong kind of underwear or, oh, we need a special kind of shoe or all sorts of fun things that arise throughout the process. Um, and just keeping things day to day moving, making sure people in the shop have what they need, that the actors have what they need, the designer has what they need, um, but mostly functioning as the uh, logistics person for the designer to make sure that they have what they need. I got here because I went to UCSD and <laughs> um, in undergrad, was one of the few people wanting to do costume design, so I was in the shop all the time. And luckily, as I was graduating, the shop manager at the time needed somebody who was willing to be paid very little to do a lot. So <laughs> I got hired, and then um, as sort of general shop help, and then I worked on all sorts of shows and badgered everybody around me until they let me assist on shows, and then that became more of a permanent decision. So. Um, I've worked as a dresser, I've worked as a stitcher, I've done a little bit of everything, which is sort of what you gotta do if you wanna work in costumes. <laughs> and anywhere in theater, I suppose. So I've been here for eight years and have been assisting for about half of that time. And got to assist on Fly, which is the show we're looking at today, the one for Paul Taswell. Um, bring this really cool vision to life of this wonderful show that we had so much fun making. Um, with really cool costumes, we don't get to do a lot of fantasy stuff, and it's a, we do a lot of modern dress shows, which are fun, but, you know, a t-shirt's a t-shirt. Don't get to make <laughs> crocodiles every day. So we're talking about the crocodile today um, in Fly, and Fly is uh, the story of Peter Pan, but told from Wendy's point of view as she sort of transitions into womanhood. And the crocodile is sort of the embodiment of the islands and of growing up and of change and womanhood. And Wendy's relationship with her, she starts off scared and then moves into having, you know, understanding her and understanding that she too has to grow up to have a full life. And so the crocodile is an interesting creature because we wanted her to be womanly, but also sort of otherworldly and have some representation of an actual crocodile body. Um, so how we do that, and I'm just sort of going to use her as a way to go through sort of the costume design process in general as well. So obviously we get a play, and the first thing we do is read it, which sounds obvious, but um, you read it and you start to think, okay, what does this play mean, and what do these characters do, and who are they, and how might clothing or costume represent who this character is? How do we put a physical, a physical costume on them to embody how we want this person to, or character, crocodile, human or otherwise, to be uh, understood. And so once you read the play, you start to plot out the show. So that means we literally make a uh, spreadsheet plot where it shows each scene and what each character, who each character is and what they're doing. And we enter, you know, any sort of notes like, oh, well, this person has to skate across the stage at this point, so we know they need roller skates or something like that. Um, and we plot out the whole show. And with the crocodile, um, this being a new play, we didn't necessarily know everything she was going to need to do right away. And that's something that's very common in uh, creating new plays, is that things change and we need to be fluid. And so without knowing exactly what she was going to do, we made her her own <laughs> crocodile plot um, as the ideas started to come together, just to see what she might be doing in each of the scenes, because we weren't sure how she was functioning yet. We weren't sure what exactly she looked like. And we weren't sure there was one point where, you know, parts of her tail were going to fly and do all sorts of stuff. So we made a little crocodile plot, which is a breakout of that bigger plot that every show gets. Once we have our 
break out, our breakdown, that inform, starts to inform the research and the conversations between the designer, the director, the script writer, the choreographer, or anybody else who has sort of a hand or say in what this character does, and even the actors once the actor gets brought on board. So the next step is sort of research. So this is an example of some of the crocodile research. So he was really interested in the scarification, uh, actual crocodile skin, and different uh, fabric manipulations that we could do to sort of uh, imitate the skin of a crocodile and the, a crocodile tail without actually using crocodile skin. And then once the designer and director and choreographer, et cetera, et cetera, have sort of honed in on an idea, the designer then does what we call a rendering, which is draw out what they think they want it to look like. So that's what then the shop gets to see as well as all the research. The shop, the designer brings the shop the rendering and that's what the shop uses to build off of and uses reference. And that's sort of our blueprint. So once the designer has given the shop the rendering, we start to decide how to actually make the thing happen. So there's sort of the four ways to get costumes. There is pulling, which means grabbing it from stock or borrowing it from somebody you know. There's building, which means taking the fabric, building it from scratch, like a dress, you know, start from a pattern and making it into a dress. Uh, there's buying, which means you go to the store, you know, go to JCPenney's and buy the t-shirt. Or there is renting, which they are big costume houses all over the country and about around the world where for a fee you can borrow the clothes for the duration of the show. For the crocodile, obviously nowhere is going to have exactly what we wanted, so that was a clear build, which a lot of fly was. Once we know we're going to build it, we start with the build process, which usually starts with fabric swatching, which is where uh, an assistant will go to fabric stores, either in New York or LA, or here, here in San Diego, it's pretty thin on the ground, uh, and we'll take samples of the fabrics that those stores have in these little strips, click them, uh, attach them to a card, and that is how we show the designer what fabric stores have that they might want to use. And once the designer looks through that, he or she picks out the fabric, which we ended up going for the crocodile corset with this fabric, and we buy it in enough to actually make the thing. A mock-up is a version of the costume that is done not in the real fabric, and is usually made out of muslin or some other cheaper fabric that is easy to manipulate. Um, that represents the fabric that it will be, so we can start building the costume without ruining a fabric that we've purchased, and we can play around with it and change it and show it to the designer before we actually commit to making the thing for real. Then we start the fitting usually in the mock-up so that changes that need to be made on the body can be made without permanence or without, you know, having to undo a lot of things. So for the corset, we made it out of canvas and other corseting materials, and then for the crocodile tail, which was a uh, process that involved not just the draper, who is the person who makes the patterns for more traditional clothes, but a craftsperson who has more experience in sort of making non-traditional clothing or crafts and bodies like hats, jewelry, animatronics, or any other kind of non-traditional clothing. This tail took a lot of R&D or research and development to get to the shape and the movement and like even how the tail hung off of the body. Um, and so we had a few fittings with this before we got to actually building the structure out of the fabric and materials that it was, it was seen in the show. As well as functioning as a starting point, we can usually send mock-ups into rehearsal as a rehearsal piece because something like this especially um, is going to impact how an actor functions in the space like you know this is going to whack people if she doesn't move right so we send these into rehearsal so the actress uh lisi lafontaine it was who played croc and fly um can get used to having this on her body and how to move with it and how it functions um as well as sort of an example to ourselves of what we want it to look like eventually so with crocodile this was a lot of moving parts where you know, the corset was being made by one person, the tail was being made by another several people. Um, it's, it was a big team effort. So once we have the mock-ups done and we've had fittings with that, you can move into the actual fabric structure or, you know, fabric or whatever other materials we're using. So we use this sort of scale-esque fabric 
as well as this, this was neoprene um, that makes these little triangles. It was folded squares stitched together in a long chain to sort of replicate scales and the ridges of, a, of the tails of crocodiles. And then this is made out of mostly plastic tubing and petticoat boning that is metal coated in plastic so it can be punctured through the middle. And it also, we had tried out a bunch of different materials to get the right weight because for the actress and for the way it sat, it had to be able to support itself here, but then fall away and not be too heavy. One of the challenges with doing a costume like the crocodile that doesn't exist in the world, unlike say an 18th century dress, you more or less know with a specific decade what that's gonna look like other than small details. Like I said, the croc doesn't exist anywhere, so except for in Paul's head, which he is pretty succinct in the words he uses. So part of our job was to pull out of him what he meant when he said, I want a structure a cage structure on a corset with an accordion on top that moves. So when he says accordion, you're like, okay, what does that mean? Do you want thicker? Do you want thinner? What color? What, how does, you know, is this moving right? Is this the, the shape of the hips that you like? Oh, do you want it thinner, or larger? Do you want the curve to be more of an S? Do you want the curve to be more of a slope? Do you want the, how long do you want the length to be? And that's part of this process. So it was a lot of back and forth all the way up until tech, right before tech, we were finishing this, you know, in the days before it actually hit the stage um, and kept playing around and going back and forth. And once the product is out, once the costume is done, it's like, oh, okay, I see exactly what he meant. And he had this strong vision the whole time. And our job in costume shop is to make that vision real. And so the other part besides the corset tail of the crocodile's costume was this bodysuit that she wore, which mirrored the bodysuit, the tree, dancers wore um, and Paul really wanted it to look like part of their skin, like tattooing, like body art. Uh, he didn't want it to be recognizably a costume piece. So we worked on these body suits, um, which are made out of mesh that we had printed. And part of the other thing Paul wanted this crocodile to do is to glow in the dark. They were going to use the UV light on stage to make her sort of otherworldly. So with this, we used a silicone paint with U or silicone with UV paint in it that you can sort of see these raised bumps, which went towards the idea of scarification that was in the research um, to kind of bring out parts of her body so that she glowed in her arms and her legs and her chest a little bit. And in the tail that is the, um, this neoprene, this green underneath of the neoprene gl glowed as well as this sort of crystal sheer um, green so that when she moved you sort of saw her skeleton shape and part of our job as well is to sit and tech with our designer and to take notes on anything he wants changed or updated or made prettier so as well as notes from the director or the choreography about the function of things so even though we were working on building the tail right up until tech and actually a little into tech um, there were changes that happened throughout the three weeks of tech and the two weeks of previews or two, sorry, two weeks of tech, three weeks of previews. So, you know, as, as tech is happening, changes are still going on. So we are changing costumes and adapting and adjusting uh, all the way up till opening day. So it is an ever living process until we open and then the costumes are done. And then it is 100% in the hands of wardrobe who takes care of the costumes and changes the actors backstage and takes care of the actors and um, communicates with the shop if anything falls apart and needs to be repaired. Um, but yeah, that's, so that's sort of, we work from a few, a month or so out from first rehearsal all the way until opening day and getting these costumes as right as they can be and as close to the vision of the designer and the director as possible. shop part of what we do is we have a collection of all odds and ends of different costume pieces from old shows things that are purchased between ourselves and UCSD that we get to use to pull from so for say fly for example for the last boys and things we were pulling little bits and pieces that we had and we have you know all sorts of sewing stuff that we keep uh, in stock so we can work as we go we buy things specifically obviously for shows as needed but we always have a stock of stuff with which to work. And 
And as we're working, we pull shows and put them on racks. This one's very messy right now because it's getting cleaned up. But this is sort of how we keep things as we're working organized so that we can go, okay, oh, I need that jacket. Oh, it's on that rack. Go oh, pull it, grab it. Good. And that's how we organize the actors as well in the dressing room and in fittings. Besides this wall here, we call this our wall of boxes that has mostly um, accessories and some things like t-shirts and um, smaller pieces of clothing. We have three big rooms full of costumes of all sorts, you know, pants, shirts, dresses, gowns, uh, suits, uh, shoes, any, any and all kind of thing you might think you would wear from pretty much every period. So in this storage space, which is under the costume shop, we have uh, shoes, both men and women's, not including sneakers. Um, we have men's tailored pants, men's suits. We have women's dresses of all periods. Uh, we have our ethnic wear and uh, different cultural costumes. We have women's suits. We have women's blouses and skirts. We have ties, we have belts. Uh, and this is one of our spaces, so, and this is the one we probably use the most often because it's men's pants and suits and dresses always end up in a show. So every, you know, during fittings, we're always running back and forth between this, this little room and our uh, fitting room. So this is another one of our storage spaces. This has men's period wear, cler clerical wear. Uh, it has tuxedos. It has some of our women's hats. We also have a wall of hats right here. Um, it has our men's vests, and this is another sort of dumping ground of places we can store stuff, mostly used by the UC students. This is sort of their staging ground. And then this is also where we keep um, our forms that will be coming up on the right, <laughs> um, which is what we use to stand in as bodies while we build things without the actors here. This is our crafts room where anything like hats and jewelry and shoes get taken care of. Uh, this is sort of where we keep the more dangerous chemicals and paints and anything that might make a mess on clothes we want to keep clean goes in here. As well as dyeing, like our big dye vat over here is where we dye clothes. Um, so sinks and we have a deck outside where spray paint or anything else flammable gets used. Um, so yeah, this is sort of the dirty space. These are our dressing rooms. Um, we have two of them here in the Weiss, and most of our theaters have two. Uh, we don't have what we call a star dressing room, which means that everybody ends up in the same dressing room. They're separated by gender. Um, but no matter what part you're playing, you end up in the same dressing room, so it's a nice big communal space. This is where we keep the costumes during the run, and every actor has their own little station where they keep their personal effects and their makeup and things, and this is where they get ready before the show. And where we know we can come find the costumes during the run of the show um, and where wardrobe does their work.